Good morning. I want to thank you all as well for coming, and may God's grace and his peace and his mercy be with us as we've gathered to hear from him, and even in the verses that Jason just read for our Advent reading of hope, that God would see us, even though our righteousness is as filthy rags, but that he would take us as a potter, and he would mold us as clay in his hands, and he would bring us to salvation. And so we thank him for that. And so I uh, just want to open with a, a verse we find in, in Proverbs chapter 23. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech, and put devious talk far from you. Shall we pray? Our God and our Father, we come before you and we thank you for this moment. A moment where we can take out of each week, Lord, and we can um, rest from our, our labors of the week. And we can spend it in time of worship of you, where we can hear from you, where we can be again reset for the week ahead of us knowing that everything that we do, Lord, can be done for your honor and for your glory. But Lord, we know that we have, we have failed as your people in the last week. We have not been who we are in Christ in all ways. In some places, Lord, we have maybe loved the world more than you. We've maybe ignored your word. Maybe we thought too much about ourselves and, and we forgot about you. So we ask, Lord, collectively as a body of believers for your forgiveness. Just as you brought the people of Israel out of Egypt, as you saved Paul on the Damascus road, you have saved us. You have redeemed us. You've called us. You've purchased us. You've predestined us. You've justified us. You've glorified us. And, and we are yours and, and all of our hope, every last of our hope is in you, Lord. So when we stand on that day of judgment, it will be because of your son, Jesus Christ, that he gave his life in exchange for ours, and so we praise you. Lord, we pray that this good news of your salvation would reach all the earth, including, Lord, this city of Warman. Bring the lost into this place. Let them meet you here. Save our own children, our own family, our spouses, our friends. May all who grow up here hearing the gospel, Lord, believe it by faith. Continue in it to the end. And so we pray that your salvation would even now bring lost people to you. And as we prepare to hear your word, Lord, we pray that you would prepare our hearts to receive it. Uh, may it change us, cleanse us, shape us, Refine us. Make us less like the world and more like you. We ask this in our Savior Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I invite you to turn to the text for, the, or for our message today in James chapter 3. James chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 12. And we begin by reading our text. James chapter 3, verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters or teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which, though they be so great, and are driven by fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and it boasteth great things. Behold how great a, a, a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body." And setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. 
And for every kind of beast and of bird and of serpent and of the things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil. It is full of deadly poison. Therewith we bless we God, even our Father, or the Father, and therewith we curse men, which are made after the similitude or the likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear all berries? Either the vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh water. Thus far the reading of God's word. James, the author of this book, is the brother of Jesus. And if we look at the whole book of James, this whole letter, uh, we would see, just as it is in our text, he has a, a big focus of his, his, a focus of his is bringing the Christian believer to maturity, sanctification, as we talked about or heard about in deeper life uh, messages. He has the same goal as the Apostle Paul in Colossians, speaking about Christ, he says in Colossians 1 verse 28, he says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all my might, that he powerfully works within me. So this is the same pastoral burden that Paul has, is what James has here, is to bring us, his readers, to spiritual maturity in Christ. So that our whole beings would be uh, permeated by Christ, that every area of our life would reflect our Savior. And James says here in chapter 3 that spiritual maturity actually reveals itself by how a person uses their tongue. Having control, mastering the tongue is actually one of the clearest marks of a true Christian, a genuine believer. It's essential for gospel ministry. I don't have a title for my message, but the way the message came about, uh, I, I had finished preaching out of uh, the book of Job, and I, was, I had all kinds of ideas of what I should preach on, and I had some experience, a few experiences where... Uh, with, with, with certain people that I felt, and all of a sudden I was brought to this passage because I felt like, well, what they were saying about others and stuff wasn't right, it wasn't good, and I thought, well, you know what, we need to hear James chapter 3. Only to find out, as I studied it, the very next day that I would fall, that I would offend in word, in what I said in many ways, and that I would have to go and ask for forgiveness and repentance. And I say that for us to understand that I don't think, or don't think that this message comes to you as it first came to me, that, oh, others need to hear it, but it comes to you as I have had to hear it myself first. And that we all need it. As we will see, James tells us. And so... As we make our way into James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12, we notice that there's some just very basic principles. And one of the basic principles is that the, the tum, tongue is very difficult to tame. James gives a word of wise counsel to those who would be masters or teachers. In verse 1, not many of you should become masters, he says, or teachers, because, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be, uh, you receive a greater condemnation, or you're going to be judged uh, stricter, or greater strictness. And why would that be? I, th I think one of the reasons would be is because, as a teacher, you need to understand that you have an influence, that you have um, a potential to influence um, for good or for evil. 
And if, if, if we, if um, whenever, whatever you teach, no matter what you teach, words lie at the heart of the teaching. How do we teach people? We teach them by example, but we're always explaining our example by our words. And so to have an unreliable tongue can produce the same effect in those we are teaching. There should be a multiplying effect when we teach. Which is, if you're a teacher, you recognize a great, great responsibility. But it's also a great opportunity. And notice James in verse 2. He doesn't speak as one because he's Jesus' brother, because he's been with him and he knows him and, and, and all of his experience. He doesn't speak as one who's achieved this level of controlling his tongue, but, or as one who's arrived. He is very aware of his own shortcomings, for in many ways we offend all. Or, or, or we, we stumble, we all stumble, he says, in many ways. He recognized that he too stumbles in what he says. If any man offend not, or doesn't stumble, in word, in what he says, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. You see, James, maybe he was one of the brothers, one of the family, who when Jesus began his ministry in Mark chapter 3, verse 21, he was one of those who Jesus has uh, called his disciples. He is now teaching his disciples. He's been teaching some crowds. He's done some miracles. And it says in Mark chapter 3, verse 21, when his family heard of it, they went out to seize him, for they're saying he's out of his mind. James knew what it was like to say the wrong things. But James's words here don't just apply to those who are called to teach, to those uh, who are Masters. We all use our tongues. Every one of us. So if mastering our tongue is a sign of Christian maturity, it is for all believers. How we use our tongue is clear evidence of where we are spiritually. Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew 12, verse 34, You brood of vipers, how can you speak good? when you are evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. How true, how often has not our heart been revealed by what we've said. Verse 2, James says, the person who controls his tongue can control his whole body. And if he doesn't stumble... Or if, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and, also able, and able also to bridle the whole body. So the, the control of the tongue, sometimes we think of it this way, that it, it just be able to control our tongue in the way that, you know what, just don't say anything. Just be silent. That's not what James is talking about here. Although that's part of it. But it means to be able to control it. Speaking graciously when needed. Giving words of warning when needed. Speaking the truth in love even when it hurts. That's the control of the tongue. And being silent when we should be silent. See, sanctification in every area of our life always has that, that, that double um, um, dimension to it. The, the, the putting off and the putting on. And so we no longer speak like we once did, but we still speak. We speak now graciously, mercifully, lovingly at the appropriate times. And maybe we don't speak when we used to always speak. Sometimes we're now silent. Chapter 3 isn't actually James's first reference to speech, though. Chapter 1, verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue... But deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. If we confess Christ, and we don't bridle our tongue, we've deceived ourselves. The control of the tongue is not the ability 
or sorry. Yes, if, if we, uh, or in, in verse 26 here, he is talking to those who would call themselves believers. And we need to, again, it's, it's one of those checks that we have in, in, the, in the scriptures. Is that us? Do we profess Christ, but our mouth shows otherwise? Because our mouth will portray what is in our heart. Has our heart been transformed? If so, our speech will be not perfect, but it will be transforming. You see, James says that person's religion is worthless. It's vain. In chapter 2, verse 17, James also says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. You know, it's in our speech that we can often clearly see that relationship between faith and works. A transformed nature, transformed heart, will automatically transform our speech, what we say. It will reflect the one who has saved us. It will, it, our speech should now reflect the holy nature of the one who has given us new life. But taking you back to verse 2 here, um, James, he, he's kind of forced into a confession in how, you know what, we all offend. We all offend in what we say. We stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble, he is, in what he says, he is a perfect man. Perfect man. Who did not stumble in what he said? Our Savior. He, Jesus, is a perfect man. The perfect man. He mastered his tongue. So our only hope at mastering our tongue is if we are Christ and that we put our tongue under the control of Christ, under the control of his Holy Spirit. Our only hope is that we were continually, by the power of his Spirit, being made increasingly like him. And this is a battle we wage, not just the first years of our Christian walk. This is a this is an enduring battle. This is a lifelong battle. It is fought continually, daily, moment by moment. Are we fighting the battle of our tongues? Or have we given up? See, we need to seek to win this battle for a very important reason, because our tongue is, it, it's such a small thing, and yet it has such great potential. So, so the tongue, number one, is difficult to tame. Secondly, I want us to see the disproportionate power of the tongue. And James uses these two very familiar and common uh, illustrations to make the point very simple and clear for us to understand. In verse 3, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. The tongue is like this small little bit in the the mouth of a horse. And with that small bit, we now have control of the great energy, the power, and the strength of this horse. We control it. So the the little object, it's, it's way out of proportion to what the power that it wields in controlling the horse. Or verse 4, Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, are driven by fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm or a small rudder, whithersoever the governor listed. So, ships too. You know, and James wasn't, like, there was big ships in James' day too. The ship that carried Paul, remember, or was supposed to carry him to Rome, didn't quite make it, had 276 people aboard. We read that in, in, in the Acts of the Apostles. And so we've got these great, heavy, big ships, and yet they're turned by a small rudder. See, the rudder's size is out of proportion to the whole of the ship, and yet it is what controls it. And James was on verse size. He says, that's what the tongue is like. Even so, the tongue is a little member and broasteth great things. 
Why does James say this? Because he wants us to realize how powerful, how much power the tongue wields. Both for good and for evil. The tongue, Jesus says, brings out the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. It is from within, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And some of us are so used to the, the polluting words of our own tongue, the, the disregard for those God has made as an image, and how we slander and use our tongue that we don't even notice the harm we do to others or how we tarnish the name of our Savior. And yet there is a positive side. Um, Solomon talks about it in Proverbs in, in many places, and I'll just quickly reference to him. He, 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 he contrasts the, the negative side and the positive side to the tongue in Proverbs 12, verse 18. There is one whose word, rash words are like sword thrusts. So they do harm, they, they hurt, they kill. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 15, 1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of fool pour out folly. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. So James here, like Solomon, sees the tongue as an instrument of extraordinary power in proportion to its size. And it is connected, we see from other scriptures, to the heart. Whether the heart is hardened by sin or it has been recreated by God's grace. So even though it's small, it has great influence. It can do great damage or it can bring great restoration, great healing. James's main purpose, though, in writing about the tongue is to bring about conviction. Conviction of sin. Because the tongue is difficult, uh, to actually it's impossible to tame in our natural selves by our natural um, strength. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. It's difficult to tame. It's out of proportion or it has a disproportionate size to the power that it wields. And, and thirdly, he, wants, or he gives us an example of the destruction of of the tongue. James gives us again a few brief uh, examples to, uh, or illustrations to make his point crystal clear of the destructive power of the tongue. The tongue is a fire, verse 6. The tongue is a fire in a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. We all know a small spark can start a great fire. A small spark can destroy a forest. All it takes is that uncontrolled spark. A sharp, unkind word. Gossip. Speaking things we don't even know about others who we don't have a clue, but we're just assuming. Slander. The tarnishing of others' reputation to others. Lies. Those are the sparks that set in motion a fire that cannot be distinguished or extinguished. Words can consume like fire. They can destroy a life. They can destroy families and relationships. And James is very specific on the source of the words that destroy. He says they come from hell itself. Your tongue is set on fire by hell. Remember that next time that these thoughts come to your mind. Or these words roll off your tongue that these things come from hell itself. The tongue is a world of iniquity, a world of unrighteousness. No other part of our body has, has such great potential for disaster and destruction as our tongue does. Be 
because it is the source or it gives voice to our inner man, to our heart, to the sin from within. The tongue defiles, stains. The tongue is set among our members, defiling the whole body, staining the whole body. The tongue doesn't just stop at staining itself. No, it spreads evil out and it stains our whole body, our whole being. It's like, it's like eating garlic. You start eating garlic and you love garlic and it's good for you and you're feeling healthy and you begin to eat it every day. And soon you don't even notice the smell anymore. It's just great and it's lovely. But everybody else around you knows exactly what you're doing. And as you're trying to talk to them, you always have to walk further, and they're walking further back, and you're wondering, why is everybody walking away from me? It's because the smell hasn't just permeated your breath. It permeated your whole, every pore of your body. Or like you're doing the laundry, and, and, and your wife puts in a white load of laundry, and you come along and think, oh, it just started. You quickly throw your red shirt in. And out comes everything, a terrible pink. Staining the whole load permeating your whole body. That's what this tongue that is said among our members does if, if we do not bridle it or control it. It is actually like the devil himself in verse 8. It's an unruly evil or a restless evil. It's, it's, the unbridled tongue is like Satan. He, he's restless. He's going to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. And the tongue is marked by evil, or the unregenerate tongue is marked by evil, always attacking others, seeking to lift themselves up, speaking untruths or falsehoods or gossip or slander about others. It is full of deadly poison. Verse 8. James sees it the same as Paul seen it in Romans chapter 3, verse 13. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. This is naturally true of the unbeliever. We understand that. Trouble is, church family, and what concerns James here is that those same destructive words can flow off a believer's lips. And how often don't we demean or belittle, slander or gossip about a brother or sister in the church? One whom Christ has died for how easily it is to tarnish our Savior's name when we fail to master our tongue. But James goes on in verse 7. Every beast, every kind of beast, and of bird, and of serpent, and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even our, the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude or likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not so to be. And, and does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? James has already said in chapters 1 verse 8, that a double-minded man is unstable in his all his ways, and here he speaks of one who's a, a, a double-mouthed man. Or one who speaks out of both sides of his mouth. Or, or what sometimes has been described as a, someone who has a forked tongue. He is a contradiction. He is a contradiction that ought not so to be. He is like a spring pouring forth from the same, both fresh water and salt water. He... James says that doesn't happen. What James is saying is a man who doesn't bridle his tongue is more contradictory than nature itself. You won't get fresh water and salt water of the same spring. Like a fig tree bearing olives. It doesn't happen. Or a grapevine producing figs. It does not happen. And James's words are sharp. 
They are words that pierce like Hebrews, and they discern the thoughts and the tension, intentions of the heart. We are created in the image of God for what reason? To worship Him and to bless Him. And it is bl uh, a blatant double-mindedness to speak out of both sides of our mouths, blessing God and then turning around and cursing those whom He has saved, or those who He made in His own image and saved by His Son. And James, what he does is he, he pricks our consciences and he says, you know, that's a contradiction that ought not so to be. But if you're listening today and your conscience is pricked and you say, you know, that is me. I have failed. The question that came to me was, well, James, why don't you give us a practical way or practical ways to deal with the tongue? How are we supposed to deal with this untamable tongue? I didn't see the practical advice here. Or, or how, do we, how do we change? And as I struggled through that and I read through the book of James over and over, all of a sudden I realized that this is exactly what we need. We need to stay in the text of God's word or in the book of James long enough. We need to have patience with the Lord. And as we wait on him patiently, it will become clear. That if we look at James chapter 3 in light of the whole book, that James has given much practical advice on how we are to use and control or bridle our tongues. So I'm going to take you through a few of them. Not all of them, but a few. James 1 verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. How do we practically tame our tongue? We ask God for wisdom. Lord, what do I speak? How do I speak it? When do I speak? When am I silent? Verse 9 of chapter 1. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. You see, the only rejoicing we have is in that we are exalted in Christ. That we have been saved by him. So we... We, we, we don't boast in the things that we've done or will do. We boast in what Christ has done for us. Verse 13 of chapter 1. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. And so we, we watch what we are, our accusations, especially uh, what we say or accuse God of. We don't say false things about God. And then the easy one, the one that we've all got down pat in verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For most of us, or I should say maybe for me, usually the verse would read, he is slow to hear, he's quick to speak, and he's very quick to get angry. This is how we practically bridle our tongue. We listen first. We think about what we speak. We're slow to anger. Chapter 2, verse 1. He gives an example. I'm not going to read the whole thing there, but he gives an example of the, a rich man coming to your gathering and a, and a poor man. And, and you just pay all the attention to the rich man because you think, you know, you, you, uh, you show partiality to them and you, you don't really worry about the poor man who's dressed in, 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 in rags. And he says, you know, we don't do that. We need to learn Christ's way, the gospel's way. We treat the rich and the poor with the same love, the same respect. We don't show partiality. How do we bridle our tongue? Well, in chapter 4, verse 11. He is talking to those in the church. This is for us practically, brothers and sisters. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law 
and judgest the law, but if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. So we don't speak evil of each other because we're not the judge. Who's the judge? Christ. He will judge. So we don't become the judge. We allow Christ to judge. Verse four, or chapter 4, verse 13. You know, we don't go and, and boast on what we're going to accomplish. Oh, I'm going to go there, he says, in those verses, he says, you know, I, I'm going to go there, I'm going to do this and that, and I'm going to make a profit, and then I'm going to return, and I'm going to do this and that. No, no, he says, we don't boast about those things. We say, you know, if the Lord wills, we will go do this and that. And we're never to hold a grudge, or, or we're never to grumble. James verse five, chapter 5, verse 9. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Again, behold, the judge standeth before the door. So we don't hold grudges against each other. We don't grumble against each other. Verse 13 of chapter 5. We are to speak to God in prayer whenever we suffer. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. We're to sing to the Lord. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. We confess whenever we have failed. Verse 16. Confess your faults one to another, and we are to pray for others in need. Pray for one another that, they may he that ye, ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then verse 19, brothers, if any of you do not err from the truth, or if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. So we are to speak words of restoration to the erring brother, to those who are wandering from the Lord. So when we read James chapter 3, 1 to 12, in the context of the entire letter of James, we see that James's sobering analysis of the tongue is surrounded by the most practical counsel for every one of us in our day-to-day -day lives. And James chapter 3, like the rest of the Bible, causes us to see that our tongue shows us the depth of our depravity, the depth of our sin, the darkness of our heart, and it shows us our need, our desperate need of a Savior. While I was preparing this message, I was also preparing for something else, and I was um, reading in Isaiah. I was reading Isaiah chapter 1 through chapter 6, and often we read Isaiah chapter 6 by itself. But in Isaiah chapter 1 through or 3, 4, and 5, Isaiah, God's great prophet, is giving Israel a convicting message like James here. He is pricking their consciences. consciences. He is um, sharing with them the wrath of God that will be coming upon them because of their disobedience. And in chapter 5, he speaks and he gives five wo or six woes on God's people of Judah and Jerusalem. And whenever we read the Old Testament, we know that when there's, some, there's the number six, we're usually expecting a seventh. And here, Isaiah, he has um, shared with the people of God that God's holy and righteous wrath and anger is going to come upon them as he gathers the nations around them to execute his judgment upon them. And then there's the seventh woe in chapter 6. Do you remember on whom Isaiah pronounces the seventh woe? Isaiah meets God face to face in the temple of God. God's train, of his, the robe of his train of his robe has filled the temple. There is smoke that is beginning to fill the temple. The foundations, he says, of the temple begin to shake and tremble. 
And Isaiah is undone. Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And to make things matters worse, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people, or I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When he's seen the Lord, his he was exposed. God's holiness exposed Isaiah's unholiness. The light always exposes the darkness. The very area God had called him to serve him with his mouth, to proclaim God's message to the people, was the very area that he had to pronounce a woe on. Wretched man that I am, Woe, woe, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. You see, sometimes and often I think we have it a little bit backwards. I know I sure do. That we assume that our struggles are in areas of our weakness, where we are weak. But when you read the scriptures over and over and over, you will again see how it's often not where we're weak, but where we're strong, where we're gifted, where God has called us, that sin has made its home without us even noticing. But when we're made to see it like Isaiah saw it, when we are, or when we are exposed, Our self-deceit is laid bare and we are brought to repentance. Then God can make us and use us as he was going to do with his servant Isaiah. Remember, the, as, as Isaiah pronounces the woe, the angel of God takes a tongs and he takes a, a hot coal off the altar and he touches it to Isaiah's lips and he, he purifies Isaiah's lips. And God says, who will go for me? And Isaiah, Isaiah says, I will. You see, it's only when we repent, only when we recognize our sin of our tongue, our lips, confess it to the Lord, that he can take and renew us, cleanse us, make us a new creation in Christ, and then use us, send us out. See, Notice how God lovingly regenerates us in, or in James chapter 1, verse 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be the first fruits of his creatures. That's the power of the new birth. That's the power of the word of truth, God's word. It creates in us new affections. We no longer talk the way we used to talk. We don't use the words we used to say. We don't gossip and slander and, and tarnish others like we used to. But the word of truth doesn't just help us begin the new life in Christ. No, it sustains us. It, it carries on. It, it, it helps us. There's, there should be continued progress as we continually feed on the word of God. There, our tongues should be continually cleansed. <laughs> transformed by the word of God. As our hearts hear God's word again and again, it is renewed. And it begins to produce in us a transformed tongue. And so we need to allow the word of God to... to to dwell in us, we need to give opportunity for the Word of God to dwell in us so richly that we can't speak with any other accent. Like Christ, he's tempted in the wilderness. He says, you know what? He tells Satan, you know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The more we feed on the Word of God, the more the Word of God will do its sanctifying work in us. 
Think of Jesus Christ, our example, our Savior. In Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah is prophesying about what we've seen, or what the gospel writers wrote happened. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought before the lamb to the, as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so opened he not his mouth. Why? Why was Jesus silent? Because as he stood before the high priest, and as he stood before the judgment seat of Pilate, Pontius Pilate, he was silent because he was accepting the verdict of guilty because in a sense he was guilty because he took all my words. The times I have cursed. The times I have slandered. The times I have used my tongue to degrade those whom he's made in, my, or in his image. And he took that guilt upon him. And so he accepted the verdict of guilty in my place. And in his body on the tree, he bore the sins of my lips and my tongue. You see, if we want to control our tongues better, and if we want to follow Jesus' example, we need to desperately understand. This is, this is absolutely important, church. We have to understand that Jesus is a Savior first. We don't come to him as an example and we try to try and try and try on our own so that we can hopefully get to the place where we, we are good enough that then, then Christ will save us. No. We come to him as a Savior. We confess how guilty we are. And it is then as he saves us. Once he saves us, we understand that the, that. He has taken God's judgment, God's wrath for our every sinful word and he's wiped the slate clean. He has cleansed you from the guilt of it. It's only then we can understand that he can deliver us from the misuse of our tongues. We have to come knowing or, or conscience, conscious of our sin first. And once we do, we'll discover that He is a glorious Savior. A loving Savior. A merciful Savior. Although not perfected yet, our tongue now sings a new song, like the psalmist. We sing new praises. His praises. We speak with a new accent. We speak as one who sounds a little like Jesus. Because we have found pardon. We have found renewal in him. Keep your heart. We began with Proverbs. Keep your heart with all vigilance. For from it flows the spring of life. Put away from you crooked speech. And put devious talk far from you. Let's pray. Lord, as we come before you, we don't have much words to say except for the fact that we see and we know we are guilty before you in the words that we speak, in the thoughts that we think. We have not spoken of you in a way that is always edifying or spoken of those you've made in your own image in a way that is, is pleasing to you. Lord, this message hits home to each one of us today. We ask, we ask, Lord, that you would bring us to a place, not just recognizing that, but to a place of true repentance. That we would desire to speak like you, that we would desire to have an accent that reflects you, that one that shows mercy to others, shows love and grace instead of judgment and slander and gossip. Help us, Lord, to bridle our tongues, control our tongues. We ask you now for wisdom. 
in words to say, words not to say, when to say them, how to say them. We ask that you would control us by your spirit. And Lord, we, wanna just, we just cast ourselves before you and, and, and uh, we rely totally on you, your spirit, and your, and your son, Jesus Christ, who has saved us to sanctify us, to bring us to a place where we reflect who you are, that we as a church would encourage one another with the words that we speak. And the more and more, Lord, as we look into your word, we feed on your word that you would do your sanctifying work of all of our tongues. We thank you in advance for the answer of, your, of, of this prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echo back their joyous strains. to you, or I haven't preached this message to you as one um, who has not, as James said, stumbled in many ways. And so I, I bring the message to you as one that, as I mentioned before, you know what, I was brought under great conviction as I studied it of my own life, actually to the point where I wasn't going to preach the message. Oh, Lord, no. First, I'll get better. And it was then that I was convicted by his spirit says, you must preach this message because it's for you. It's for all of us. 
And so even though we stumble in many ways, we offend in many ways, we trust in the one who has not stumbled in word, but he is the perfect man. And we trust in him and his spirit to help us to be able to bridle our tongues as his children. So let's go this Christmas season, this Advent season, as we already sang, using our tongues to praise the one who has given us this great salvation. Let's bow for the benediction. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You are then dismissed.